in this video we will run through the survey as part of Fort. Um, this survey has two real goals. Um, one of them is to give some feedback to those that complete it with resources and uh, tutorials <clears throat> that can be used to help incorporate or continue to incorporate uh, principles and teachings of openness and reproducibility within courses. And the second main goal is to give us some more information uh, that we can use for advocacy towards the widening and furthering of these teaching practices, as well as doing our bit to advocate for increased support of teachers, instructors, and um, other academics in this sphere. The information that you provide will be useful for both of these purposes. Um, we think this will be a useful exercise for anybody thinking about their course, and I hope that, um, that it's a useful experience for everybody. Okay, so we, we will run through this using a a hypothetical example that I'll loosely base around a course that I've delivered. Um, the first page is a consent form that I won't go into too much now. It's mainly just to note that we're going to use some of the anonymized data to keep a track of how much openness and reproducibility is contained within courses so that we can also use that in some of our communications with stakeholders and uh, for example degree granting institutions um, to kind of further our goals of advocating for openness and reproducibility within research training okay so we will consent to this after having read it extremely carefully of course um, second page on the survey is more information about Fort itself and our rationale for starting Fort. So I won't simply read out all of this. Um, in a previous video, either myself or Flavia or both will give a good overview of Fort, its purpose, how we hope to help the teachers and instructors with this. Okay. At the bottom of this page, there's several resources that might be useful to, to you. One of them is the Fort manuscript that's a longer form introduction to Fort, both the purpose, both the, the social justice element, the open science element, the integration of openness and reproducibility, not only in the content that's taught, but in the way that um, the research content is delivered in terms of treating uh, teaching materials like any other academic product as one that can be valued and shared within and outside of the research community. Okay, there's also a link to the Fort website as well as uh, the onboarding process for any of you lovely people that want to join us in our in our mission and to work towards making Fort a a really useful tool for people. Okay, advert done. Um, we'll ask for some general information. Um, so I work at the University of Oxford. Can't type and uh, talk very well. I won't fill in all of these because that would be extremely tedious for people to watch. Um, we also ask for a job description um, because teaching will be I guess more or less expected depending on the position, maybe maybe more or less um, a core aspect of I'm currently a postdoc, so we'll go for that. We also ask how long um, how long uh, whoever's completing this about their course has been teaching and mentoring within higher education. Okay, so we treat teaching in this case is more delivering of courses, lectures, seminars, and so on. Mentoring could mean a number of things. Um, the simplest um, 
option for mentoring is, for example, the supervision of research students at the undergraduate, masters, or um, graduate level, for example, in in their research projects. It could also be um, wider mentoring that's outside of that. We're we're quite broad by that, um, but in general. If you provide some kind of mentorship to students that's around openness reproducibility, this would be a good place. And the, one of the core reasons that we included this is because it's not only teaching that students get a, a core aspect of their research training, it's also the mentoring, particularly through research projects, but also elsewhere. And it was really important for us to include this within thoughts in general. Um, you will be prompted if some of the questions are unanswered. You can still leave them blank if needed. The more information, um, the better for us, but that's all fine. Um, I'm going to continue without answering just to proceed through. Um, to give a full example, I'm going to go through teaching and mentoring. If Now, when we run through teaching, teaching in the current version of the survey, you can report up to five, I think, different courses that you teach on. Um, mentoring is a little bit more amalgamated. We've not expanded that into multiple kinds or, for example, for each student or anything like that just yet. Okay, so we'll go for teaching and mentoring. Um, so we'd be asked to put in a bit of information. So. Uh, I've done some teaching in psychology and the course in particular was, um, let's just call it end of the year. So this is like live coding, making mistakes as we go. Um, now this was for undergraduate students. We, we then ask uh, a couple of things that are entirely optional but can be really useful for us in terms of looking at it. Um, so we'll ask for a, a brief course description, so that might cover uh, the layout of the course. Um, so for example, the, the course that I gave um, was two three-hour workshops, I guess you could call them. Um, and you might also here put information about the the layout, whether it was more lecture based, whether there were practicals, for example, whether um, students are expected to be doing this as part of a core course, whether it's an optional module, how long it runs, there's any number of information that could be covered here. Um, topics covered can be as broad or as specific as you like, we'll ask very specific questions about the open and reproducible aspects that are core to to, to thoughts in in our kind of clusters. Um, but in here, that can also be, be useful. So, for example, uh, mostly in this course, I talked about stress, but I also talked a little bit about um, pre-registration power. Uh, coding or syntax. Oh, if I could spell, that would be useful. Um, and the further the further comments is also a place that's interesting for for us to have some more information. Um, so this could be broader about the context of the course. For example, the course that I taught, um, I had an awful lot of freedom to be able to adapt the previous material. Um, so initially it was um, broadly about stress, randomized control trials, and um, one of the assignments was set up as a kind of randomized control trial so that the students would collect some data and then analyze it at the end. Um, now I adapted that quite a lot, mainly because I wanted to um, very enthusiastically let them know more about pre-registration and open science and the importance of power and uh, coding and things like that within within projects, um, largely because the the term or the semester afterwards, they'd be starting their final year research projects. So I felt it was really important to cover some of these uh, research aspects. Um, whereas in other courses, it might be the case that people have less of a choice 
and we think that would be useful information for us to have here. You can put as much or as little information as you like. Obviously, the more information you give us, the more information we'll have. Um, and it's just a good way to get the background on the course. Okay. Um, so a little bit of information here. There's We've set up the survey to follow the seven clusters that we put together within Forts. Now, they were put together from a kind of informal literature review that we felt covered broadly the aspects of open and reproducible research um, kind of separated into, into broad areas. We'll go through each of them. Within each one, there's kind of subclusters or content areas that cover some more specific things. Um, what we'll be asking within the survey is for each subcluster or content area, several things. So the first is essentially whether it's taught. Um, and that can give us an indication of whether students are expected to engage with that material, whether it's more optional, or whether it's just not involved at all in the course. We'll also ask about the degree to which students interact with the course. Now, that typically means, um, means the difference between sort of having for example, the knowledge level that we talk about, students engage with that concept, that material. So for example, they might be told about pre-registration, um, but they don't necessarily engage with it or, or run a pre-registered study, for example. Uh, we then have practice. So that might be, for example, in, in a workshop or, or a seminar series where students engage with that particular practice. So for example, they might run a replication study as part of a as part of a seminar. Um, now that gives that gives practice. They've actually engaged with it quite a bit. And our kind of maximum level above that is really that they the students have used that practice within a research project. Usually this might refer to a final year research project. It could also refer to a project within a shorter course. Um, but the important thing is that the students really have to engage in that in that aspect of research, usually outside of a more kind of canned example. And finally, for each cluster, we'll ask if you want to receive any further information about it. Um, what we have on the very, very final page is a feedback page. And for each of the clusters and subclusters that you want some more information about, we'll have a collection of resources that you'll be able to uh, find that may, may be useful in terms of expanding your own knowledge on that area, but also in terms of uh, resources that you can bring to your students. In future, that's also going to include the pedagogies that really thought is built around and will uh, incorporate much, much more of. Um, now these pedagogies will allow researchers to take, for example, existing mat teaching materials and adapt or borrow, uh, reuse those materials and plug them into their own teaching in order to help uh, support the, the onboarding of that particular process within their teaching and hopefully reduce some of the burden and mean that instructors that are interested in doing this don't have to do it from scratch. That's kind of what we're all about, is trying to, to help our teachers. Um, and you can also hover over um, most of the information to find out a little bit more where it's less clear. Okay. Now, the first cluster is surrounding sort of knowledge around the reproducibility crisis, credibility revolution, many of the things that we could call it. Um, now this could cover a lot of content. Um, we've broadly split it up into six areas. Um, now to bring it back very briefly to the questions that we're asking. So we're asking about the degree to which um, each student each content area is prescribed to the students. Now we've called that 
informal and formal um, for the purposes of this with the idea that more informal is um, is kind of closer to a more optional course whereas formal would be more that the students are actually assessed on this principle in some way um, and we also talk about the degree to which students interact with the content area so again whether it's knowledge whether we're trying to impart the the understanding about that particular principle to students or whether they practice it or whether they apply that practice within a research project you can also choose um, a none or a not included for both of these if it's just not in the course at all um, if you're unsure also feel free to to go for don't know that's perfectly fine if you want to find out more again hit yes or no here so the the six subclusters that we came up with for for this um, was surrounding the general history of the the crisis and the revolution um, which is quite is quite broad but gives can give a lot of background the distinction between exploratory and confirmatory analyses um, we talk about that a little bit in terms of pre-registration I guess as well if you have gone to the pre-registration introduction to open science workshop you'll have already seen my face quite a bit too much um, talk about questionable research practices their prevalence what can be done about them talk about uh, proposed initiatives to improve research practices ongoing debates um, is there really a replication crisis uh, Bayesian versus frequentist lots of things could come under this um, and also the ethical considerations now one thing that we've included for each of the clusters is a an optional uh, feedback box here we're well aware that our current system is not all-encompassing there are going to be principles that we haven't included or there might be some overlap between some or it might be the case that some of them don't fit with certain areas and that's fine it will just be really good for us to know um, particularly if we're missing huge areas um, because then we can expand and adapt this framework so that it can more more broadly represent a wider range of research areas um, in this same box if if any of these uh, subclusters either don't make sense or um, or it's not clear you can also let us know about that there okay uh, I'm gonna leave this one in particular blank let's assume that I didn't tell my students anything about why <laughs> I was trying to teach them how to do some of this statistical stuff okay so let's take the statistical example and this will be the main one that I'll fill in um, okay so none of the teaching that I did would be in this case was classed as formal so I the students were told about null hypothesis testing p-values type 1 errors um, I didn't touch on Bayesian research at all let's go back to, to this one actually so we did talk about the logic of testing talked a little about a bit about power as well which is below but we only went for knowledge here students weren't expected as part of um, any exercise to actually play with type 1 type 2 error rates or to be able to demonstrate it in anything now let's say I want to know more about that I'll hit yes over here as well now I didn't tell them anything about uh, Bayesian approaches because I only had a few hours um, but let's say again I want to know more about it because this, maybe maybe there'll be a simple way to include it in next year's teaching possibly not for Bayesian but you never know and at the very least I want to learn more now we did talk about effect sizes um, so I'll put that in the informal um, and actually they were required to report effect sizes and talk about power so I can actually say that they practice this to some extent 
Um, now let's say I don't want to know any more about power because I've heard far too much about power in in the last two years for a lifetime. Okay. Um, now we did talk about research design sampling methods. Um, we did talk about the implications for inferences. In fact, that if anything was part of the the assessment that they had. So they were expected very clearly to interpret the the results in light of the the implications based on all the previous. So again, we'll we'll call that informal. We'll call it knowledge. Now again, we talked about. Um, questionable, perhaps we didn't talk about questionable measurement practices or reliability issues. Um, that wasn't part of this course. So we'll have that as not included. Uh, let's say I do want to know some more about that. Uh, and let's also say that I didn't want to know any more about the last one. And the relationship between all of the above is a little bit vague, um, but this is intended to indicate that Um, this is intended to indicate that it's also important to to teach the relationship between, for example, the research design, the power of the study, how they in, how they interact, how that interacts with the quality of the measurement that's involved, how that interacts with uh, type one, type two error rates, and the confidence that we can have in the results. But in my case, let's answer no to all of these. Okay, I'm gonna. Also leave this one blank. Okay. Now the third cluster is all about reproducible analyses. Um, so that's more about using uh, scripted analytic pipelines, usually in some kind of coding or programming software, um, as opposed to uh, user interfaces solely. So our first principle here, strengths of reproducible pipelines, is kind of broadly that there's some teaching about why it's useful to use some kind of reproducible pipeline instead of, for example, a standard point and click. Now in the course that I delivered, um, in, in my idea world, I'd have loved to teach, teach some programming, but there wasn't time. The students did have some experience with SPSS, so I thought I'd build on that. They hadn't used syntax before, um, so I thought introducing them to the SPSS syntax would be a useful exercise. So in that case, I quite explicitly told them a lot about it. The, um, the use of this was talked about informally. Um, it wasn't formal because it wasn't included in, in any kind of assessment, and this is um, this is a kind of optional part-time course as opposed to being part of a more core curricula that every student has to be involved in. So, we call, so we're going to treat that as an informal. Now they didn't have to write about it in any kind of assignment. They did have to practice the reproducible pipeline. They were expected to put together some code in class and then they were given data at a later time to actually use. So we'd count that as practice. Now we also talked about scripted analysis compared with user interfaces. It's kind of similar to the above, and again, they were asked to practice with that. We'll answer no to indicating the um, to wanting to see some of this in the feedback because I'm happy with why included. Data wrangling. Um, so data wrangling broadly we describe as the process by which data is manipulated into formats so that it's actually usable for analyses. Um, so that could involve removing outliers, calculating some scores, all of the kind of data processing that isn't strictly the analysis, but is kind of everything that comes before. Um, so in that case, that actually wasn't included in, in the course. They were pro provided with fairly canned um, data sets. So I'm going to call that not included. But maybe I want to hear more about it in the feedback, so I'll, I'll click yes to that. Now, they did do some programming data analysis that was included. Um, they actually used that as part of the assignment, and they were uh, told to actually include their code as part of the assignment. So we, we can call that practice, which is very useful. Now, we didn't talk at all about open source and free software. Um, 
I think I included a short meme to compare different programming languages, but that was more for the fun of it than it was to actually have anything particularly educational. So let's say I want to learn more about that myself as well to help. Now, the final one, tools to check yourself and others. Now, this could be many things. Primarily, we had in mind tools such as StatCheck, um, Grim, Sprite. Um, so these are tools that essentially work almost as statistical calculators. Um, StatCheck in particular is useful to look at, um, at currently APA formatted, but hopefully that will be expanded, uh, statistical results in papers. And the idea is that it works as a spell checker. So if the degrees of freedom and the test statistic don't match the p-value, it will give you an error. Um, and that can be useful to check in your own papers and also in others. Um, so learning about tools like that can be useful, which is why we've included it as a cluster. But actually my students, I didn't tell them anything about that just because it would have, it would have taken a little bit of time and I didn't want to burst the bubble about research just yet for them. Okay, so, um, so as you see, I've, I've selected that I want some of these resources to learn a bit more about later, but not all of them. Okay, now, open data and materials. Now, again, if, you, if you're part of any of the um, open science workshops that are part of this conference, you'll have heard a lot about open data and materials. We think it's really important that students are taught about both um, in many, many areas, both in terms of doing the sharing and also making use of the sharing. Um, and so we've included that. So open materials also includes publication models. So we might want to teach students about um, open access, being able to access, well, papers. Um, on our second, we have kind of reasons to share. So many reasons to share both materials and papers and resources and code and data. Um, and it's useful to explore those as part of an exercise. We get into a slightly more practical element. So repositories like the Open Science Framework, um, GitHub, Figshare, and many others to be able to share and locate these resources. Um, we have a cluster on accessing this, the ethical considerations around open materials and data. Um, for example, what data should or shouldn't be made openly accessible, what constraints are put on that, how anonymity and safeguarding uh, handles with open uh, data and materials, uh, and also examples and consequences of accessing open or unopened data. Um, I'm going to leave all of these blank for the sake of saving a little bit of time. And, and again, we can continue that answering. Please do fill this in if possible. Um, again, this is purely for example's sake and for saving just a teeny, teeny bit of time. Okay. In the course that I was teaching in, we also included pre-registration, which is our fifth cluster. Um, so uh, let's run down the um, this aspect first. So this was a more informal course in the sense that uh, it's not required by all, it's not part of the assessed course, it's not part of the, the core course, um, but it's more of a module that students could take. So I'll run all the way down. So the purpose of registration, well, they, they got some information about that. The, um, the difference between pre-registration and registered reports, we covered that too. Um, now we didn't cover the more specifics about um, different types of pre-registration, for example. Um, so when it should be done, when it shouldn't be, talking about um, secondary data analysis and so on. So we'll call that none. Um, now understanding different types of pre-registration and actually going through writing one. Um, we did do a little bit of this, it was uh, in a more relaxed and formal way compared to a full registered report, which is why when we come down to it I'm just going to call this one knowledge rather than full practice, but that's 
at your discretion when you complete this. Um, we did not talk about comparing a pre-registration to a final study manuscript, although that is, again, an exceedingly important part of it, both because the students that we teach now may become future reviewers, but also to train the skills around pre-registration and research practice. Um, now we did conduct a pre-registered study. They, they pre-registered their analyses. We ran it. Again, it was within what we had six hours in total over two weeks. So we didn't have much time, but we did what we could. So they got some knowledge about the purpose of pre-registration. They got some knowledge about the strengths and differences between different kinds. They didn't find out too much about um, when can you pre-register or comparing the pre-registration to a final study manuscript. Um, but they did conduct a pre-registered study. Um, again, more of in a practice way than in a full, full uh, research study. Now I'm going to say that maybe next year I'm going to run this course again, but I want to really up the amount of pre-registration. So what I'm going to do is hit yes to all of the, um, do I want more information about this? And we'll get some more information about that at the end. Okay, cluster six. Originally we only had six clusters. We recently added the, the seventh, um, and I'm quite excited about that too. Okay. Um, the sixth cluster is replication research. I'll go through this one pretty quickly. So we talk about the purpose of replication. So what what is a replication? What's the difference between a direct? Um, for example, what's a failed replication? Talk about large scale replication attempts. So whether that's the um, the Open Science Collaboration, whether that's um, other projects, it's important I think to talk about these these broader large-scale projects so that students are able to conceptualize the importance of replications and large-scale replications too. Uh, we also have uh, the four others so distinguishing direct and conceptual replications is a really interesting and useful useful aspect of research so um, so that students can understand that. Um, we have a cluster around conducting the, the replication studies. We have an additional cluster that goes a bit further into the registered replication reports, so kind of in combination with the pre-registration cluster, and also a broader discussion of the politics of replicating studies, um, the, the wider spread impact that it has on research culture, uh, potential fallbacks, all of those kind of things. Again, useful things for us to to think about and that our students can learn from our experiences in doing. The final cluster is academic life and culture. One of the tenets of thought is we can only really judge the quality of our teaching by how much we teach the process of research as much as we teach the output of research. Now, a huge part of the, the process of research is the academic life and culture that, that research is contained within. So if students are more able to understand, for example, the incentives in academia, the different types of academic positions and the general structure of academia, as we've included here, then hopefully they'll be more able to understand the landscape in which um, all of the other clusters kind of uh, coexist. Now in here we also have uh, aspects of citizen science um, involving the public. We have team science and big team science. So for instance, multi-lab studies, things like the Psych Psychological Science Accelerator um, are all important to, for our students to understand and, and know about. Now we'll leave this one blank again for the sake of time because I realise that we're getting on a bit and you've already seen me fill in quite a few of these pages. At this point we can choose to assess teaching for another course, we're not going to, um, but if you do have more than one course that you'd like to assess, that's great. We have a fairly broad description of course. In this case we're thinking more about the 
the individual courses that instructors take um, as opposed to, for example, a entire degree program. Um, just want to try and make that clear because obviously definitions are going to differ between different countries and institutions. Okay, so I so in mentoring, in terms of, for example, advising or supervising, these kind of principles can also come through. So, for example, I I supervise undergraduate and masters students. Um, we can also describe the mentoring a little bit more here. So I might say um, I supervise these projects. Uh, maybe the master's student is a two-year project. Maybe the undergraduates are also co-supervised with someone else. Just here it's useful to get more of a picture about what's being taught. Now at this point we we don't ask about all of the, the subclusters um, in the same way as before. We um, just collapse it across the, the kind of top level clusters. So in my case, um, the students that I supervise, I will always talk about reducibility crisis and credibility revolution and all of the aspects involved. Um, in a way, this is also a formal part of the courses because it's compulsory for everybody to be involved. I guess actually, I'm going to correct myself there. I would call this an informal um, because it isn't something that all students get. It's something all my students get. Um, but this this is a, a nuance that we won't go into too much. Okay. Um, now I always tell my students about the reproducibility crisis. Um, it doesn't always end up featuring in the final reports or anything like that. Um, so I'm going to call this knowledge. If I was being, I could call it practice. I'm going to I'm going to call it knowledge and just say that I I want to know more about that in the future. Um, they always go through a lot of the statistical kind of aspects that I've mentioned before, and they get to apply it within their research projects. Um, I tell I often tell them about reproducible analyses. Um, but quite often we don't get a chance to go into that. The master's students usually tend to, um, but undergraduates usually don't have the, the training in programming to be able to. Similarly, we will always cover open data and materials, um, but usually in a knowledge base. My master's students have actually been pre-registering their analyses, so we're here. None of my students are doing replication research, so we'll call that none and not included. Um, and as part of the kind of mentoring general meetings, it won't feature into their projects specifically, but we will end up having kind of conversations about the way that re research is structured and how they might be able to navigate that. So let's say I don't want to learn about any of these. But let's say I let's say I want to learn a lot more about replication research because I'm want to teach I'm want to supervise a student on a replication project in the future. So we're going to learn more there as well. Okay. So ooh. let's find out which question I missed. Ah, this one on the top. Okay. I'm gonna leave that. Please fill it in. Okay, on um, we also we have a Fort newsletter, so you can click yes, and that will sign you up for that. Um, we also ask a few demographics that we'll use. Um, now this is mainly to keep an eye on the level of all of these practices that are taught across countries and institutions, and to give us data that we can use to track in the future to see how these practices are changing. And this will be particularly useful um, as we continue to partner and contact or continue our contact with stakeholders and degree, degree accrediting uh, societies because that kind of information is useful for us to advocate for incorporating these practices within teaching. We have a bunch of general um, demographic kind of information so we'll jump through that. Um, if you have any further 
uh, thoughts on your teaching, then please do add them at the end. Um, so if your course was developed, or if you made it from scratch, if you're able to share resources, if there's any links to resources that you have here, that would be awesome. Um, Fort will be collating pedagogies, so teaching materials, uh, teaching experiences that other instructors can learn from, adapt and reuse. So this is also a good place to mention, mention those. Okay. Now, on, now we have a feedback page. So based on your responses to the I would like to hear more about this, this final page has a collection of useful links, resources, tutorials um, that you can go through to to help to understand these concepts more and maybe to bring them into your teaching as well. In the future this will also include the pedagogies as I've said so that it will also have the teaching resources that can be adapted. So here we have um, some information from the conceptual and statistical knowledge cluster on all of the aspects that I clicked that I wanted to find out more. Um, you'll note that we have, so that was one, the first and second cluster, but we don't have any for the clusters that I didn't want to read more about. Now we can also scroll down to replication research. So it's, it's been a little while since we were there. But you'll notice that um, when when I went through it for my courses, I clicked that I didn't want any information about these, um, but for mentoring I did. Um, now, when you click it for mentoring, it will give you all of the all of the subclusters. So I've got a lot of information here about the purposes of re pre registration, registered reports, what can I uh, pre register, understanding, conducting a uh, pre-registration and so on um, and we also have resources for everything else um, so you can save this page copy and paste it into into a document so that you have it um, you can also find a lot of these resources on the Fort website um, in order to help integrate them within your own research training now that is the end of the survey. Um, be careful that if you do want any of these resources to get them to get them straight away. Um, just in case you can't get them after hitting, hitting complete. Um, on the thank you page, you can also again find the preprint, the website, and the onboarding process if you would like to join Fort. Um, so just to finish this video, I want to say thank you for putting up with me for a whole 40 odd minutes. Um, I hope that the survey tool is a useful one for you to run through. I think there's a lot of useful resources at the end that you can learn from and kind of use some of their information to incorporate within your teaching and to share with your students. Um, and it's I've personally found this uh, a useful way to to reflect on my own teaching and what I do and don't include. Again, not in any kind of uh, judgmental or this should be done in any particular way, um, but more as a kind of reflective exercise. I hope this was useful and I may see you in another one of these videos soon. Thank you for joining.